Uh, David Cameron, the Foreign Secretary, has given a very uh, combative interview to the Sunday Times this morning where he's talking about Iran uh, should be accountable for its terror, as he puts it. Certainly there have been attacks overnight backed by the UK, the US, other countries like Bahrain and others as well, not providing military support, but I don't know, moral support, financial support, whatever it is. Let's get into this with Will Geddes, who's the international security expert who keeps us up to date with these things on Talk TV. Will, good morning. Good morning, Peter. What happened overnight? What's going on? Why is it going on? Well, you know, it's a continued wave of attacks, obviously, against Iranian proxies, as you say. Uh, we had 85 attacks, um, certainly or certainly launches against Iranian-based proxies and also members of the Iranian Republican Guard, who are really the forefront operational uh, arm, if you like, for Iran in both Iraq and Syria. But then overnight, we had 36 attacks carried out by 24 planes in Sana'a, which is the capital of Yemen. Now, this is a sustained and continued attack, obviously, to take out very precise targets. These are weapon and munitions dumps. This is uh, command centers, intelligence centers. And these have been undertaken, even by the figures we're getting back from both Yemen and from Syria and Iraq, a very limited number of civilian casualties, but very, very high effective strikes against, obviously, uh, their assets, the assets, obviously, of Iran. Will Iran get the message, do you think? Yeah, they will get the message. Uh, whether it's going to cease anything um, is another matter, Peter. I mean, at the moment, obviously, we're in a bit of a deadlock with Hamas, and these attacks, obviously, that Iran are using through their proxies are in support of Hamas. Uh, however, at the same time, Hamas are not coming to the table to discuss what they want as a ceasefire because they're refusing to release the hostages. And that's really the key point in all of these actions. If there is a ceasefire, would it deter the Houthis? Would it deter, deter excuse me, the Iranian Republican Guard? I'm not really sure, Peter. So it's all linked. I mean, this is, do, do you worry about a wider regional conflict, uh, Will? No, I don't think so. I, th I think ultimately this is, again, precise targeting. This is really taking out the strength and the capability of the Iranian Republican Guard and the Houthis. However, the Houthis have already made a threat against the fiber optic cable in the Red Sea, uh, which is what their next step they believe they can do. So inevitably, the coalition forces, the US, the UK and its allies, are going to carry out sufficient attacks to remove the submarine capabilities of Houthis to prevent them be being able to to do so because if they knock out that fiber optic cable that could have very very drastic impact obviously across not only africa and the middle east but also the uk as well we heard from colonel tim collins who I interviewed yesterday the iraq war hero about the iranian republican guard he described it as a state within a state do, do you agree with that assessment and, and what assessment would you have of their capabilities and intentions yeah, no, I, I, I certainly agree entirely with Tim on that. When, when I was in Iraq, for example, there were a number of sorties and uh, insurgencies by the Ira Iranian Republican Guard into Iraq itself, just after, obviously, the war. Uh, so they've always been looking at sort of land grabs. They've been looking to sabotage, disrupt, and, and try and create as much chaos as they possibly can in the vested interests of the Iranian state. However, they are, to a certain degree, as Tim said, uh, a law unto themselves. What about the uh, British rule within that? We've talked about the sort of international community, and of course Britain are now part of these attacks, joining the United States. Um, the, the catalyst for at least some of this appears to have been the three US soldiers who were murdered a few days ago. Uh, should the UK be getting involved, in your opinion? Yeah, absolutely. I think we need to stand by our allies, um, as we always would in any kind of conflict. And ultimately, we do have a vested interest as well, Peter. You know, we, we are equally as impacted by the operations of these terrorist groups. And let's, let's not call them anything else. They are terrorist groups. Uh, Iran may not be flying necessarily a very visible flag behind it, but they're financing these operations in the same way as they're financing Hamas, they're financing Hezbollah, they're financing the Houthis. You know, they are doing everything they can to try and work through their proxies to cause as much disruption as they possibly can. We look at the north. We look at, for example, the Red Sea, Peter. Now, the number of ships that are passing through the Red Sea, which is key for trade into Europe and the United Kingdom and elsewhere across the world, has diminished from 500,000 to 200,000 vessels. Insurance premiums are shooting up. So we will be directly affected by what the Houthis are doing in the Red Sea. 
and they have had a sustained number of attacks and many of the drones that they've launched against not only commercial vessels but also military vessels have been financed and supplied by Iran. What do you think happens now, Will? Grant Chaps, the Defence Secretary, says this is not an escalation. Do you think that's right? Yeah, no, I don't think it is an escalation. It's taking out strategic targets. But let's also look at uh, the, the way that these targeted attacks have taken place. Uh, these have been telegraphed for the last week or so. You know, President Biden is not the strongest leader, and I think we all agree on that. Uh, and he has been talking about, obviously, retaliatory attacks for the attacks in Jordan. So ultimately, there has been sufficient forewarning that any civilians could inevitably move out of those target areas. You know, they will not be completely ignorant to what is happening in their local areas. So it is taking out those strategic targets. That's not to say, Peter, that the Houthis or the Iranian Republican Guard haven't moved some of their key assets. But what we're taking out is the lion's share of their capability. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating because we've seen the uh, assassination of uh, Saleh al aruti the deputy leader of Hamas's political wing in the southern suburbs of, of Beirut, uh, for example. I mean, tell me about Hezbollah's role in all of this, because as we have been talking about and as Colonel Tem and you have, have been saying, you know, it's, it's, all, it's all linked. Well, you know, pretty much like you were saying about the Iranian Republican Guard, you know, Lebanon doesn't have a national army as such. It has Hezbollah, and Hezbollah is pretty much a law unto itself as well. And we've seen sort of attacks both from the south by Hamas, and we've seen attacks by Hezbollah from the north. So Israel has been pinched, certainly, by attacks on both sides. But Hezbollah has also got very, very strong ties to Iran. And Hezbollah, for many, many years, has run terrorist attacks into Israel. So, you know, we have to defend our friend, which is Israel. Uh, we have to provide them with a support as well. Now, that's not to say that Israel haven't been carrying their, out their own actions against Hezbollah, but Hezbollah is certainly a force to be reckoned with. It's made up of many hundreds of thousands of members, and they do have, have capability. And it's cutting that supply chain, Peter. That's really what it comes down to, preventing is, uh, Iran from providing with Hezbollah equally to Hamas the capabilities to be able to attack Israel or elsewhere. And again, as we've seen with the Houthis, they're attacking not Israel assets, they're attacking international assets. Well, you have uh, very successfully uh, dealt with a number of ambushes in your life. Uh, here's a slight verbal one you may not be familiar with. I'm sure you'll be absolutely fine to answer this question. There's a report today, the Defence Committee, uh, we're going to talk to its chairman in a minute, concluding the UK armed forces have key capability and stockpile shortages and are losing personnel faster than they can recruit. You're an international security expert. How ready would Britain be if there was, uh, God forbid, war with Iran or Russia or some other international actor? Well, well, you've got you've got two questions in there, Peter. The, the first of which is obviously which country potential, which nation could possibly attack us. If we're up against Russia, then we certainly need the strength of the United States, obviously in their capabilities, because they have obviously a far higher surplus than we do. Uh, certainly there's been uh, intelligence of the US moving much of its capability, or some of its capability, I should say, to the United Kingdom to support us. If we're up against Iran, it's going to be much more low level terrorism types of attack. So uh, there are very different types of warfare dynamics that we're possibly facing here. But in terms of our resilience, Peter, we're, we're not in the best of places. Let's put it that way. It's interesting as well, because so much of the warfare essentially that goes on is online, is, is virtual as well. And there's so many, we're talking about conscription and so on, people being, we think of 19 year olds at boot camps, but actually there are lots of people who are perhaps older and let's face it, less fit and healthy, who could be helping uh, from, a, from a cyber perspective. How much is that part of modern warfare, Will? The, the, the cyber side is, is absolutely integral. We've, we've been under attack from not only Russia, but China and various other states, including Iran, on a cyber level. You know, we are truly talking about asymmetric warfare here. We've got warfare from a ground level, guerrilla level, and such as uh, terrorism. We've got cyber and we've got large scale. So, you know, you're looking at a cyber attack, which is continuous against the United Kingdom, fundamentally looking at our infrastructure, trying to take out power stations, trying to take out utilities, trying to attack the financial services sectors. So, you know, we, we have to be protected on so many different levels and we have to be resilient on so many different levels. From a cyber perspective, we're in a pretty good shape. Uh, however, there is no such thing as 100% security. So we always have to be on our guard. 
But again, Russia is using proxies, and, and this is something that we see far more of these days. Many nations not actually using their own attributable assets. These are deniable assets which can carry out these attacks, and they can deny it. How worried should we be, do you think, Will? There's a good question, Peter. I think we have to be on our guard. But I think, you know, in the same way as I was mentioning about Biden telegraphing that those attacks, obviously, against Iranian assets was going to take place, obviously, over or Iranian um, supported uh, target uh, over the last week. I think we need a little bit more shock and awe. You know, we, you know, America has obviously the, the largest military capability there is in the world. We need, obviously, to align with our allies. They are there to help us, as we are to help them, and that's why we need to co-venture on many of these operations. But I think we need a bit more shock and awe. We, we need to surprise the enemy. I think letting them know what we're going to be doing is one thing. But I think this really, again, circles back, Peter, to Hamas releasing the hostages. That is the key point of the conflict between Israel and, and Gaza. They have to release those hostages. And there was, obviously, a ceasefire negotiation in Paris quite recently. And many, many members of both Qatar, Egypt, the CIA, Hamas, all got round the table. And Hamas are refusing to obviously hand back those hostages. And that's the key thing. The moment that that happens, then we're talking a possible ceasefire. That may de-escalate what we're currently seeing.